Welcome to the Complete PAC Learn Series. This is a lab discussion video from an introduction to RS5000 Volume 1, the first lab project found on approximately pages 12 through 18, Configuring RS Lynx Drivers. Well, we had to pick some place to start in this manual. We could either start with RS Logix 5000 graphical user interface, or we could start with RS Lynx Classic. It's kind of which came first, the chicken or the egg. We need them both to start out. So we'll just get RS Lynx out of the way. Now, RS Lynx has been around for a long time. So um, if you did the 500 platform, then you're already familiar with RS Lynx. But just in case you are a programmer from another platform of PLCs and you didn't use RS Lynx, we'll throw it in here. And it's a good review anyway. So um, the configuration procedure. Now what you're looking at on the screen here is <clears throat> RS Lynx Classic Gateway. Now this is the one of the high-end versions. You would probably be using RS Lynx Classic Lite. Um, and light is limited to basically what you need to to do the projects in this manual. We won't even get into what Gateway is. That's another uh, lecture in our video series. I think it's called RS Links. If you go watch that, you'll see the difference between Gateway and uh, Developer and uh, Light, etc. Now, <clears throat> looking at mine. Uh, these are the drivers that I've been using. So obviously I've been doing something on Ethernet. Uh, this was the driver that I used to set up the emulate for the 500. Now I don't need that. And then this one is the one that I had been using for the Compax Logix processor. And you can see as I expand it out, it shows the processor. That's because I'm going in the processor, the front of the processor, RS-232 and then through the processor to the back plane. Now in the back plane you see the processor again. Well, this isn't the processor. This is up here. And of course you'll get to that uh, later in this manual. So this is like a graphical placeholder to show you what's in slot zero. But this is actually the processor as far as RS links goes. So you come in that little connector there on the bottom of the processor, which is RS-232, you go out the back of the processor onto the back plane, and on the back plane, you can look, turn around and look back the way you come, came and see the processor, or you can travel on down the back plane and you see a L35E Ethernet port and a 7, 1769 bus adapter. Uh, these are all things on the back plane. Now with this particular hardware um, platform, each module has its own section of the back plane. So you don't have a chassis that you slide modules into. Every time you snap another module onto the end of the last one, or the first one connected right to the processor, you're snapping in not just the module, but the section of the back plane that will extend on through the back of that module to the next module to the next module, etc. <clears throat> so I'm going to delete um, these drivers. So right now we're in RS Who. Okay, I'm gonna close that. That is RS Who. That is a separate application that runs in RS Links, so you can browse whoever's out there. So we'll go to the <clears throat> double-headed snake. Uh, one bite for one of these puppies. So there's no tail to grab here. The other end will turn around and bite you. And we'll look at what we have here. So I'm going to delete um, all of these drivers. So I'm starting from scratch, just like you all. So I'll close that and then go back to configure drivers. Now, we're talking about communications. So if I go up here to communications, look at the first two choice. RS who configure drivers. RS who configure drivers. So you can do it from either spot. 
configure drivers. So if you look here, it looks like you can't do anything but close or ask for help. But wait, there's an active drop down list. So we're going to choose RS-232 DF1 devices. We're not going to assume that you have Ethernet because if you have the least expensive used processor out there, it's going to be, I think it was called an L31 or an L30, but anyway, it has two RS-232 ports on it. It does not have Ethernet, has no Ethernet capability. Now, personally, I would hold out and spend a few more bucks and get one with Ethernet capability. So. Okay, RS-232 devices. Now, a device is an actual piece of hardware. In this case, the RS-232 DF1 device is that 9-pin sub-D shell in the front of the processor and the electronics that it connects to. It is a device that connects between that connector and inside to uh, the processor system. So we're going to add it new. I'm going to keep the default name. I never change the names. Uh, simply because if I call it uh, monkey shines, you know, I might know what that is tomorrow or the day after, but a year from now I go look and say monkey shines. What kind of driver is that? You can name them anything you want, but you have to do it right here. Once you say okay, that's the name you got. Now, I'm going to assume that my USB connector is in COM4. I did not think to check before I started this video, so... I'll pick COM4 and hope that's where it is. Now, in the um, in the manual, it actually shows you how to go to the device manager, open up ports, COM and LPT, and it'll say USB serial port. In my case, it says COM4. I'm assuming it's still COM4. So I'm going to say configure driver. Now, things are going to change here because when I hit configure driver, RS Links is going to start sending out messages out of that COM4 port and if it doesn't hear anything back right away within literally milliseconds it will change one characteristic one of these parameters and send it out again when it finally does get a message back this is aha I've got the right format so auto configure that was too fast Auto configuration successful. Now that's never too fast when you're in the field and the production manager stand lean over your shoulder wondering what you're doing. So the faster that comes up the better. Typically it goes through a few baud rates before it says successful. But notice this changed and at least that changed. I wasn't watching the rest of it. Okay so you hit auto configure and by the way I'm using a particular USB to RS-232 adapter to another special cable going to the RS-232 port on that L35E processor. Now, everyone's going to have a different computer. I happen to have a Dell, uh, what is it, Precision M6700. Real nice laptop. Got USB 3.0, everything on it. But, if you have an RS-232 port on your computer, so much the better. You're not going to need the USB-232 adapter. So, I'm going to say OK here. Now, if you've got Ethernet, we do show you how to configure the Ethernet driver in the lab book. So, whether you have RS-232 only or Ethernet, I would use Ethernet if that's what you have. Ethernet is much easier to work with. So, click OK. It says it's running. Now we're going to close the configure drivers box and we're going to go up and we're going to look at RS who. See there's only one driver there because I deleted the rest. So I'm going to expand it. Oop, there's my compact logic processor. Now <clears throat> the last project that I did was called analog. That was a project that I did developing the analog section of this uh, PAC learn series. That Man, that, that lab won't be in volume one. That's probably volume two. I have way too much material to put in one volume. So, but that's why you see the word analog there. That is something that I typed in. Otherwise, it would just say Compact Logic Processor. So let's expand that. <clears throat> There's our back plane again. I already explained that th this is a graphic placeholder. This is your Ethernet port, and that's your 
uh, bus adapters. So they're actually both ports. This one is a port on the front of the processor. Let's see, it looks like a little daughter card. And this is a port, parallel port, that's on the, uh, if, as you face the processor, it's on the right side towards the back, towards the bottom. And that's where you, as you slide on power supplies and modules, uh, and you slide the little lever to the left that pushes the connector from the one you added into the one you added it to. And if you have the hardware, you know the process. So that's RS Lynx DF1. That's one of the things we did in the first lab. Um, <clears throat> now there are startup modes for the driver. So I'll, I'll close this and I'll go back to this and I'll go to startup. I wouldn't change this. Now, I would leave it automatic for now. However, I will say this. If, you have, if you're working in a manufacturing facility or uh, you support a lot of customers and each of them has a different configuration, then you would have named the driver. Let's say that um, one of your customers is the widget company. Instead of letting it be ABDF1, you would let it be widget company DF1 or Monsanto DF1. And you can create all these uh, uniquely configured DF1 drivers for all these different either process lines or companies. Then you change this to manual and then you select the one you want and start it. Okay, so there's a start button, a stop button. So if you had 10 of these DF1 drivers here, they'd all be stopped. You'd go in and select one and hit start and away you go. So uh, that's another little thing that we covered somewhat. And then we um, did talk about how to change uh, the ethernet configuration in your computer because with um, with these processors, any of them that have RS or that have Ethernet support, you can set them up for a D DHCP, which is dynamic host, or for static. Now, normally dynamic is done with boot P. That's a special little procedure that you that kind of comes with RS Lynx Lite. You can run it, and when it runs, it it um, it hears anyone out there yelling out their MAC ID, their MAC address, which is really your internet address. That's the address of the module. The IP address is not really truly an address. It's a temporarily assigned, I guess you could say, four octet identification. So with boot P, uh, when you first set up your system, um, you plug in everything and no one has an IP address. They're all set to dynamic except for your laptop and boot P displays all these Mac IDs and then you go in and you assign an IP to each Mac ID and then anytime you want to redo that you just run boot P again and let it reassign any IPs that are lost. Now typically I use fixed ID IPs. I go in and I put in a fixed IP in the processor and I use a fixed IP in my laptop. So we show you how to do that in the manual. Okay, also something that we do in the manual is I took this uh, page long expansion from an RS-232 uh, DF1 driver to show you <clears throat> that you could expand uh, to the far reaches of the realm by going in through the RS-232 port on one of these processors you can go anywhere that there is to go through any bridge module. As long as it's connected and it's powered up, you can go and look and see who's there. You can right click on each of the objects, look at the properties, etc. Now I'm going to, I'm not going to throw that up on the screen here. So, uh, that does it for the first, we'll call it lab procedure because you actually did go in and set up a driver. Thank you. Thank you for watching. 
the RS Lynx lab discussion and introduction to RS5000 volume 1. If you want more information on RS Lynx, if you go to the PLC Professor YouTube channel and look for a red and black label video, you'll find roughly four or five of them that discuss RS Lynx in more detail. Again, thank you.